So you've got the world parsed up into things that are making you happy when you look at them, things that get in the way that produce negative emotion, and then a whole host of irrelevant things because almost everything's irrelevant. And that's where all the chaos is hiding. The chaos is hiding in what's irrelevant. And that's a very interesting observation because since the chaos is virtually infinite, it's a real question. It's where the hell do you put it? Well, you put it in what you ignore. And you can ignore it as long as it isn't actively interfering with your movement forward, you can assume that it doesn't matter. That it isn't matter. That it doesn't matter. Same thing. All right, so here's the kicker. There's one more class of things that you can run into along the way. And this is where the chaos breaks through. So let's say you're moving from point A to point B and something that you don't expect occurs and it gets in the way. So let's say that you're living with someone and maybe you kind of like them. You're not married, so you don't like them that much because otherwise you'd ask them to marry you. But anyways, a quarter of you is looking for something better and three quarters of you is half satisfied, something like that. And uh, because we're ambivalent about such things and then the person you discover or the person announces that they've been having an affair. Okay, so then how are you supposed to respond emotionally to that? Well, the part of you that wasn't all that committed to the relationship is kind of exhilarated by that and then the three quarters of you that's half satisfied is hurt and, and you're going to exploit that part for sure in the ensuing discussions and not mention the, oh, that's kind of exciting that you've, you know, betrayed me that way. So, so, but the point is, is that you, that's a hole. Now what's happened is a hole has, you have this structure that you're walking on, like ice, like the thin ice that you're skating on, and now there's a hole in it. And the hole, we don't even know how deep the hole is, but you know there's a hole there, and so now you're anxious about it, although maybe also a little bit excited because God only knows what's down there. But you don't know what to do with that hole because it could spread very badly on you. It could be that, you know, the whole relationship was a, facade and that all your relationships have been facades and that the reason that is is because you're so damn shallow that it's impossible for you to have a relationship that isn't just a facade and that's partly because you don't pay any attention to other people and it's also partly because you're malevolent and selfish so that's a nasty thing to discover or maybe that's the sort of person that you're attracting which would make sense actually if that's the sort of person that you are so there are certain things that you can encounter that basically unglue you and what happens is that those moments of being unglued travel up that entire hierarchy of presuppositions. It's like because one of the logical conclusions to being betrayed in a relationship is that you are, that you're truly a bad person. Now another equally logical conclusion is that the person that you're with is really a bad person and another logical conclusion is all people are truly bad people. You know, I mean, in macro ways and in micro ways, you can't trust anyone. You can't trust women, you can't trust men, you can't trust human beings, you can't trust yourself. The whole place is a catastrophe, it's a nightmare. Well, then you can fall through into chaos. Or maybe, you know, you're supposed to be getting a promotion at work, that's good. You're all chipper about the promotion at work and you walk into your boss's office because he or she wants to see you and they say, well, you know, we've reviewed your performance over the last few years and um, your performance has been somewhere between mediocre and decent and we're downsizing and see you later. That's not a raise or a promotion, that's for sure. That's a hole that you fall into. And the question is, well, what do you make of that, right? How do you frame that? How do you take that emergent chaos and make habitable order out of it? You don't know. Is the whole capitalist system rotten to the core? I mean, that's a convenient explanation under those circumstances, that's for sure. Were you working for a psychopathic son of a bitch? Did you make the wrong choice in university and was that your father's fault because you never did what you want or was it your fault for not standing up to him? Or is it a dying industry or is maybe this a wake-up call that you should go do something else that you've been waiting to do, you know, that you've actually wanted to do your whole life and that's why you're doing such a miserable job at your current occupation because you're bitter and resentful about the fact that you never did what you want. You don't know. It's all of those things at once and that's very stressful because all of those things at once is too many things and that's the re-emergence of chaos. That's the flood 
That's the return to the beginning of the cosmos. That's another way that it's been represented mythologically. It's that you voyage all the way back to the beginning of the cosmos when there's nothing but undifferentiated chaos, and that's what you're confronting. And maybe it's too much for you, and often it is. I mean, that can really, that can be traumatizing. It can hurt your brain, you know? It's just too much for you to bear. But it doesn't matter, you're stuck with it. And so how do you respond to that? Well, some of it is catastrophic negative emotion. You freeze, and that's protective. And maybe you don't even want to move. You don't want to bloody well get out of bed for a week. And that's because your body is reacting as if the bedroom floor is covered with snakes, and the best thing for you to do is just not move, just freeze. Not a pleasant situation to be in, because it's you're hyper-aroused, very, very physiologically demanding, and there's zero about it that's productive, except maybe the snakes won't see you. But they've already seen you, so that isn't helping very well. So you've got all this undifferentiated negative emotion, anxiety, fear, hurt, anger, guilt, shame, emotional pain, the whole plethora of catastrophes. And then maybe on the other side, lurking down there is, thank God I'm done with that job. I just bloody well hate it. I drag myself off to work every day. And there's a little part of my soul that's so goddamn happy I finally got fired that I can hardly stand it. You know, and maybe you don't even admit that to yourself because, well, that would mean that all that time you spent at the job was just sunk cost. You're deluding yourself the whole time. Um, it is an interesting thing to consider, though, sometimes if you're in the unpleasant circumstance of having to fire someone. You know, sometimes firing someone is the best thing that can happen to them, which doesn't mean that you should go out and, like, enjoy it. <laughs> Although I have met very disagreeable people who actually enjoyed firing people. I'll tell you a story about that at some point because it's quite interesting. But, you know, sometimes if someone's just limping along in their job and doing it as miserably and wretchedly as they possibly can imagine, the best thing you can do to them for them is to say, you know, you're failing at this. And, and that doesn't necessarily mean that you would have to be failing at absolutely everything else in the entire world. So maybe you should just accept the damn failure and go off and try something new. And I mean, that's terrifying for people, and I know they hate it and all that, but, but sometimes it's better than the alternative, which is just slow, torturous death.